Well, good morning, everybody. We're we're just a couple of minutes over our scheduled start time. So thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we did set this up as a Zoom um, meeting. So, you know, feel free to chime in at any time. The whole idea here is to, to have a discussion. Um, and we would not position ourselves necessarily to be experts on ARPA. Um, I don't think anybody's truly an expert on it because it is a it is a new program and Treasury is sort of writing the rules as as we go along here. Um, but our goal here today was to sort of just share some basic overview information of kind of what we've gleaned from going through uh, the regulations as well as um, attending various uh, webinars and seminars on the topic. Um, and, and then just to kind of give a forum for everyone to talk about the ideas they have, the challenges they might have, and, and um, to just share some collective brain power here. And so uh, I know we've got folks on the call who are from our region here, the ECOG region, but I think we also have some folks joining in from Tama County, so, so welcome to you as well. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to uh, toss it over to Brittany and because I can't seem to get my screen quite right. She's gonna manage uh, our brief PowerPoint here this morning. And, and again, feel free to chime in at any point or uh, using the chat feature. I wanted to make a quick note too. We will be recording the presentation part of this um, discussion, but once we end the presentation and open up just for discussion, we will stop recording. So if there are any kinds of like sensitive types of things that you wouldn't want published, that will not be recorded. Thank you, Brittany. And so, and for, for those of you who don't know, I guess I'm Karen Kurt and I'm the executive director here at the East Central Iowa Council of Governments. And so uh, we've got a few of our team members uh, on the call here today. Um, and maybe I'll just have uh, you each briefly introduce yourselves. Uh, Adam, do you wanna go first? Yep, I'm Adam Bentley, uh, Economic Development Specialist with ECCOG. And Brittany? I'm Brittany Remby, I'm Communication Specialist with ECCOG. And Tracy? Tracy Achenbach, Community Development and Housing Director. And I wasn't sure, was Tom on the call? I can't see I, him. Up. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Oh, Tom Gruss, uh, Community Development Specialist. Terrific. All right, thank you. Um, so um, we're going to dig in and just talk. start by talking a little bit um, about the use of ARPA funds, um, how you can use these dollars. Um, so there are several different options. We've got a lot of words on the screen here. I'm not going to read these words to you, but we wanted to put them there so that you could go back to this PowerPoint, uh, which we'll put in the chat box and we'll, we'll also have on our website and refer to it if you wanted some more of this type of detail. Um, but one basic use for your ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan funds, is to replace uh, revenue that you, you the city, um, have lost. And there's a specific formula that gets used um, to ensure consistency across the nation, I assume, uh, with respect to how you determine this revenue loss. Um, so we don't know yet of any uh, cities that we've heard of that are gonna go through this exercise, but I will say, um, or that Tom from our team has pointed out that the, the growth assumption that the Department of Treasury uses is uh, like four point, is it 4.1% Tom, did you say? Oops, you're muted. Oops, he might be on the phone. Actually, I can hear him. Sorry. Um, so Definitely. anyway, it's it's relatively high relative to what we might see, and especially in some of our rural communities. So this could be worth the effort, because if you are able to demonstrate that there has been loss of revenue, um, then those funds can be used for a wider array of, of uses. Um, it kind of opens those funds up, so to speak. Um, and the only two items that would be prohibited once you've determined that there is a loss of revenue and you need to recoup that loss of revenue is that you couldn't use to pay it on principal or interest associated with debt and you couldn't use it for a rainy day fund, but otherwise um, you'd have lots of options. Um, so Brittany, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, we do have the GFOA or the Government Finance Officers Calculator attached in a link here. And again, we'll send this out to you. 
Um, and if there's anyone in our region that's kind of interested in going through this exercise, we, we'd be definitely willing to partner with you and kind of go through it because we'd kind of like to see it play out ourselves. So um, just let uh, myself uh, or another member of the team know and, and we'll, uh, we'll give that a shot. But that, that's one definite option as you're looking at how to uh, potentially use these funds. The, the next option is supporting public health expenditures. And so for most cities, um, this might involve things like uh, protective equipment expenses. It might involve things um, like putting up uh, the plexiglass barriers or, or making changes to space people out. Um, it, could improve, it could involve um, ventilation improvements to your facilities. Uh, another use is to address the negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. So providing direct aid to members of your community um, who are unemployed or who are, um, who are facing food, housing, or other types of insecurities. Um, it could also mean supporting small businesses, helping them to address financial challenges that they've encountered as a result of COVID-19 or specific industries within your community that were hit particularly hard. Um, we may have some communities where tourism would be uh, an obvious um, area that, that could have been hit harder than others. And so, uh, Tanya, I noticed you had a question in the chat box about um, police protection and fire protection. And is there something specific that that you're you're thinking about with respect to those? Yes, I know on the um, oh the first time when the CARES thing came through, we were able to submit what we were paying for con um, for fire protection and police protection because they were having to respond to COVID cases and everything else and emergency. So would that so I would submit on the first time submit um, what we paid. And that counted. Would that count for this under option B as well? Were these for additional hours put in by police no, and fire? No. no. It was just we could put it in because they had to respond to the um, emergencies with the COVID cases and stuff. So I don't believe I'm seeing that type of example as we've mm -hmm. read through. Um, read through what we've seen with, with respect to ARPA. But um, team, why don't we put that on our list and we'll do some research. Okay, thank you. And get to, get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, you will notice we do have another option that's related to pay for those populations potentially, but they don't talk about reimbursement for past expenses necessarily. All right, Brittany, thanks. Um, the next option I think is a little bit the most uh, complicated option, um, but it has to do with serving hardest hit communities and families or, or our most impoverished populations. Um, and when you're looking at this option, um, they, the act does identify some wider uses for these funds. So it could be uh, addressing health disparities and the social determinants of health, which involve a wide variety of things related to the physical um, built environment, uh, related to access to um, recreation infrastructure or edu uh, education programs, such as early childhood education. They also identify investments in housing and neighborhoods, um, addressing educational disparities and promoting healthy childhood environments. But under this category, it's not just what you can do, but it has to be targeted to a very specific population. Um, so if you go to the next slide, if you're doing these types of activities under this act, it has to go, as we mentioned before, to these hardest hit families. And the treasury um, identified four criteria um, that you could look at in terms of how you might measure where these populations are. One is if you have a qualified census tract. 
Um, so when we looked in our region, and I, I don't know about Tama County, but within our region, all of our qualified census tracts are actually in our urban areas. Um, so we aren't going to have a rural community that's going to have a qualified census tract. Um, so that probably takes care of the first two there. Um, the third talks about if you have a program or service uh, for which the eligibility criteria are such that the beneficiaries earn less than 60% of the median income. And the fourth one talks about, again, a program or service area uh, where the eligibility criteria are such that 25% of the intended beneficiaries are below the federal um, poverty line. So if you are looking to do some of these wider types of programs, you're going to want to make sure that they're going to the intended populations and that you've got a way of identifying those populations and and tracking or providing justification for that. So um, oh, this is where uh, the pay came up. So there is another option that you can provide premium pay um, to essential workers that could be your police and fire employees. Um, it could also, uh, that are direct uh, local government employees, it could also um, be uh, grants um, that would go to private employers to assist uh, with premium pay for nursing staff and, and other critical positions. We haven't heard many uh, local governments talk about this particular option. It does seem like it'd be a little bit tricky to implement. Okay, Linda, I've got a question about what about to the city library? And um, so Linda, are you talking about under uh, the previous option of serving hardest hit families? Linda, you're muted, okay. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Okay, no, I guess I should have waited with the question, but like the library, the city library was not able because of the COVID and everything, they were in the shutdown, they were not able to have their normal fundraisers and stuff. So can part of this money be delegated to them for operating and fundraising? So is in the library is this is part of the city and oh, it's yeah. a it's yeah. a um, so one way possibly would be that you could look at loss, but you have to look at that citywide, just loss of revenue, and see if that's an opportunity to be able to, because there was, um, there's this pretty high projected growth rate, and you would have lost some of the gifts to see if using their formula if you come up with a revenue lost and then that could be money that could go back to the library. Well, they, um, usually, they usually had like an auction or something. Um, there used to be a, a festival during the summer and they would have an auction where vendors would donate and they have not had that because of the COVID. Is, is there a, um, is there a fundraising nonprofit entity associated with the library? like friends of the library and organization or anything like that. Okay. No. Um, so it, it's possible that under the option of serving hardest hit families, that if there was a way to determine that um, a certain percentage of your, the users, the library users are below a certain income level, um, that you then could get funding to the library as part of that social determinants of health. So there, there could be a couple of different ways to try and approach it to be able to make funding available, but it's probably going to require a little bit of thought. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else on our staff have anything to add to that? These are excellent questions. All right. So the one that, the option that we've heard a lot of people talking about is investments in water sewer uh, infrastructure because this is a really significant need in our, our region. Um, and so for this option, uh, the Treasury specifically talks about projects that are aligned with EPA's Clean Water State um, Revolving Fund and also the Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. Um, so uh, note that 
uh, these are projects that might be in the planning phase, um, but but the funds. Uh, can only be used for prospective costs. They can't be used to reimburse the city for costs that have already been expended, perhaps for a project that's underway. Um, you may be able to use um, some of your ARPA funds for road repair if it is directly related to a water sewer project. So you've got to dig up the road to be able to fix the pipe that's underneath it. In that situation, you would be able to use ARPA funds for the, the subsequent need to repair that road. And we also did want to note that environmental reviews and uh, Davis-Bacon Act rules, which are normally associated with federal funding and these types of projects, don't apply when you're using ARPA funds um, unless there's another federal funding source involved. So if you have a major water sewer project and you have a CDBG grant um, and you're potentially looking at using ARPA funds, um, that the CDBG grant would trigger the need for the environmental review, the Davis-Bacon and those, those things. Um, but if you were just using ARPA funds alone, these requirements wouldn't come into play. Okay, Brittany. Um, and so then this just gives uh, some of the examples of the types of projects that are involved with the Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund. We actually have a link to the attachment uh, when you get the PowerPoint. Um, and, th and there's a wide variety of uses here. Um, so I, I feel like almost any project you could figure out a way to make it <laughs> to make it fit. And uh, similarly with the, uh, the next slide um, that's uh, showing the, um, the drinking water state uh, uses. So uh, the Treasury Department did call out a few additionally, uh, a few additional uh, uses for water sewer funds. Um, let's service line replacement programs. I know that a lot of our, our rural communities have older housing stock and they uh, especially those Victoria, Victorian era houses likely have lead service lines from the private property to the street. So you could potentially um, giving grants to homeowners to get those lead service lines uh, replaced because they are a danger. Um, also uh, green infrastructure type projects that are gonna kind of protect the water system overall and what's flowing into, flowing into our, our waterways. Um, I did see another question here, so. Um, let's see. So we don't have city water, but you're having an engineer do a water study. Can we purchase land for future water that would count? So, uh, Tanya, if I'm reading this correctly, you're looking to purchase land that then could be used for a future uh, water water treatment or water tower or something of that nature? Yes, um, we're doing the engineers doing a water study for us. Um, of course, that'll have to be all put to a vote once we decide um, costs and options and everything. But if, could we purchase land if they decide this is an area, this is where we could do our well and everything. Could us purchasing the land count for this project and being reimbursed? Yeah, I let's let's roll um, back up, Ripley, um to the previous slides. I construction of publicly owned treatment works. Um, I think it would qualify <laughs> if that's the first step to getting um, getting that system in place. Yeah, I'm already and, counting to the engineer. Mm -hmm. We've just started that, so that'll count for it um, to pay for that. For yep, the yeah, yeah. But I thought, well, if this could help us get the land for it for the future, but the problem is I don't know if it'll pass or not when it goes through election. Mm -hmm. the, the only thing I might add to that, Karen, would be that there's a time frame on the funds. Yes. So that might be the, with a, with a project like that, that would have um, maybe some uncertainty surrounding it and the need to allocate and then expend the funds um, that may present some of a challenge with a little bit of a project like that, perhaps. Do you think if we purchase the land and that for future, 
water. And let's say the election, we did the election because that'll be later, of course, because we're still getting information. But we let's say we did purchase the land now and we didn't do the election until later. Um, would this still count? Because even if the water didn't pass, we'd have it for the future. I've, I've, you know, I think the danger, if there's not a, a, a solid plan to move okay. forward with that, is that 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 is really tied now to water. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think you do have enough time and we'll look at the time frames here in a little bit, but I feel like you do have enough time in terms of your, when you have to have these funds obligated to kind of figure out if your console's behind it mm -hmm. or it's got legs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else here asked about painting the water tower. That's a really good question. Um, it's it, it certainly is maintenance. Um, it, it it's a little bit harder to tie it to how it's going to directly impact water quality. Um, so I would I would probably want to ask on that. So let's add that to our list as well. This is the wonderful part about this is that you guys are now surfacing these the, all these things and it, you know really kind of forces us to think about it. So um, Mary mentioned a tourism angle on the water tower painting. And so when we look at tourism, um, that was specifically identified under the helping the hardest hit um, uh, businesses. So I think it, um, or industries, and I think it might be a bit of a stretch to, to sell that under that particular uh, ARPA fund use. All right, go ahead, Brittany. I think we've got a couple to catch up here. One more. Thanks. Um, and so then the, the last thing that ARPA specifically talks about is investing in broadband infrastructure. And, um, and they've got some sp specific criteria of how they identify underserved and the speed levels that they'd like to see the investments go towards. Um, and uh, you can certainly read about that oh, when we forward this. So uh, there were some things identified specifically it called out as ineligible uses, um, one being at payments into pension funds. Often, but not always, um, ARPA funds can't be used as a match for other federal grants or programs. It does depend, though, on the program. Um, and then lastly, using the funds to directly service debt, um, satisfy a judgment or settlement, or contribute to a rainy day fund. And so as is the case with all um, one-time funding, uh, you know, we would recommend, and I think the GFOA would recommend that, you know, if you've got one-time revenue coming in, you should put it towards a one-time expense um, and not use one-time revenue towards ongoing expenses, because obviously once that one-time revenue source is gone, that ongoing expense is still going to exist. All right, so we've got a little quiz here um, just to, to kind of see what people think and we'll, we'll toss out what we think. Um, so it's, is this an eligible use under ARPA? So starting with um, providing forgivable grants to businesses who have suffered losses due to COVID-19. So if you guys wanna hop off mute and let me, uh, let me know what you think on that. Is this an eligible use? I would say yes. All right, Tracy says yes. I'd say yes too. And we would say yes as well. Um, we would see this as an eligible use um, under option C, which was addressing the negative economic impacts caused by the public uh, health emergency. All right, is this an eligible use, adding plexiglass barriers in city offices? Yes. Yes. Yes, I kind of mentioned that one, so we'll probably give a little bit of a heads up. <laughs> yes, because um, we're basically supporting public health expenditures. 
All right, making debt payments on completed water sewer line on a completed water sewer line replacement project. Oh no. No, right, because we just heard that debt service is generally not an eligible use with this program. Buying new public safety equipment. Yes. All right, I hear one yes. I hear a yes. Not sure. Can you hear me? All right, we actually have a maybe on this. Um, we think it could be uh, uh, justified under public health expenditures, um, but there might be some situations where we don't think it would be appropriate. And so just to give an example, we know that we've got a county that's using some of their ARPA funds to upgrade their radio equipment. And we would say, yep, we can see that connection to the public health emergency um, and that you're responding to more calls, you, you need better upgraded equipment just to deal with the volume. We had another community that asked the question about whether or not they could use their ARPA funds to buy, uh, what was it, Adam, scuba? Self-contained self -contained breathing apparatuses, apparatus. Self-contained yeah. self breathing ap apparatus equipment. Yeah. And in that case, there really wasn't that public health emergency response tie. Um, so we would not see that necessarily as an appropriate, appropriate use of ARPA funds. But you could use them for the radio, so right? Mm -hmm. We would so, see that as having that, that connection to COVID response. Upgrading. So, mm -hmm. okay. All right, next question. Make improvements to a local park. Yes. yes. And why would you say yes? Because it is um, promoting a healthy childhood environment. Okay. Questionable. And why would you say questionable? You know, I don't know. I just, I'm not comfortable with that quite yet. I need more guidelines. Okay. All right. So we ended up with a big, strong, maybe here. <laughs> Um, and to us, the the pivotal the pivotal thing is who is who is it serving? Um, so remember, under um, option D, which is the serving the hardest hit communities and family, that did broaden out the choices of things that you could do and and got into these social determinants of health. But you needed to be able to tie it to serving an underserved or uh, low income population, basically, um, because we don't have uh, qualified census tracts in our rural, the rural parts of our region, um, you probably aren't going to be able to, to hit this um, with ARPA funds. Um, there'd have to be another way to be able to demonstrate that it's tied to um, those lower income requirements. So maybe if you had a new housing a project that was um, for low to moderate income families and the park was being developed in conjunction with that project, perhaps then uh, you could justify the use of ARPA funds for that park. But it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a more complicated, I think more challenging test. Wave delinquent, delinquent utility accounts. Thoughts on this one? Maybe. And why do you think maybe, Linda? Well, it would depend. I believe you would have to seriously look at that for how long those delinquent utility accounts went on. Was it even prior to the COVID? That's a good point. All right, so we have a lot of maybes here. And um, we actually said, yes, you, you can do this. Although I think Linda is spot on. It has to be tied again to COVID and um, addressing the negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency. So I think you are absolutely correct that waiving accounts that exist, you know, delinquency that existed prior to COVID would not make sense under this 
this act. But generally, you can help to support people that have had um, uh, individuals that have had economic impact through things like waiving utility accounts, food shelf assistance, or um, rental assistance. So if the resident could provide <clears throat> documentation that because their accounts were delinquent was because uh, they were laid off during this time. I mean, that'd be um, a yeah, I, I think you can set up an application process and, and criteria that makes sense to, to your, your organization. We would suggest that that would be a good thing to review. Um, we would be happy to kind of sit down and talk through that with you um, or um, your attorney, perhaps just to, you know, make sure you're not asking things that maybe are inappropriate to ask. Um, but yeah, I think that that's the sort of thing that you could definitely do. Okay, so building a new trail. That's on this one. I can't answer it, but it, I need this information for my council. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants new trails. Yeah. Hopefully that will come in the infrastructure bill. Uh, but with respect to ARPA, um, again, probably for most of our communities, probably not. Um, again, because there aren't qualified census tracts out in our rural areas. It's a little bit like that local, that playground um, park question if you've got a way that connects it um, so if it were maybe a trail segment that went from this um, senior housing complex where uh, you know the majority usually of seniors have lower incomes um, you know and it and it was going to link then to you know, probably this critical link, you know, maybe, but for most of our communities, this is going to be a stretch. And we really wanted to put these two examples in here because I do, I do want you to know that you may hear larger communities in our region, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, maybe Lynn County, talking about things like trails and parks and other broader uses, but remember that they've got these qualified census tracts in their boundaries. And so it they can they can hit that other test associated with that particular use of ARPA funds. So what works for them may not work for you. All right, providing funding to a local food shelf. I would say yes. Yes. Yep. Again, you're trying to help those uh, negative economic impacts um, for individuals. And then, is that our last one? Nope, we've got one more, I think. Provide incentives to developers to build housing. Mary, yes, if LMI. Uh, yeah. And I think Mary is right on track there that um, this is a maybe and what's going to matter is the population that it's serving. So again, under that serving hardest hit communities, there is the option for, for housing support um, and or housing development, but it's got to be targeted towards specific groups. And so in this case, you'd want to see a certain percentage of low to moderate income individuals in that, that particular housing project or development. All right. Well, you guys are, did awesome. Um, so now we're on to the what if you can't use your funds? And I think for most organizations, you can find a way to use these funds. And again, if you want to sit down and brainstorm um, with us or for the folks that are in Tama County with your COG, uh, Region 12, you know, do, do that. I think putting heads together is great. Um, so just know, though, that you also can transfer um, your funds to other units of local government. So if you can't expend your funds and you want to give it to the county to help support the county's programs, that is an option, or it can go to, uh, to other nonprofits. 
the federal requirements and all of the things that we've been talking about in terms of the uses still apply. Um, and we would recommend that there's an agreement signed between the parties um, that kind of outlines um, that these are ARPA funds, the federal requirements still apply, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, yes. What if there was a question about potentially two governing agencies or entities like a county and a city that wanted to do a joint project? I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, <laughs> I was picking you up, but I'll go ahead and knock yeah. it down. Um, yeah, uh, we've had conversations with some of our communities uh, regarding potential joint projects between a county or a city. Um, and having chatted with uh, some folks about that, that would be ineligible. We, we would see that as being a, a eligible uh, under the use of ARPA funds. So, so there is some benefit to potentially doing that. <laughs> Getting more bang for your buck. Again, yeah. It still has to be an eligible use, but you can pair up to accomplish projects and both contribute towards the same project. Um, so one funding idea that we wanted to mention or we wanted folks in our region to be aware of, again, we think you can find a, a use for these funds locally, but if you can't or you just don't want to deal with some of the, the reporting or whatever that goes along with the funds or the determining if it's uh, uh, if, it, if it, there needs to be a determination about low to moderate income, you don't want to to kind of deal with that. Another potential idea is your housing trust funds. Um, you know, we have three housing trust funds in our region. I'm sure Region 12 also has housing trust funds. These are organizations that exist to help support uh, housing in our communities and, uh, and do a lot of work in our rural communities. Um, so you could give funds uh, potentially to one of the housing trust funds. And Tracy, maybe if you're on, do you want to just say a couple of words about how you would kind of envision that playing out potentially in our area? Sure. So for the East Central Iowa Housing Trust Fund or the Housing Fund for Lynn County, it's possible then that if you have funds, you could provide them to the trust fund and then we would allocate them or award them. We would advertise for projects, potential projects in your area or in your entity and then um, make those funds available for projects. So for instance, um, proposed to provide rental assistance, or if there were a project that were ready to go, uh, housing preservation. So to help people who need to do things to their house to improve its condition, that we could use those funds, maybe combine them with housing trust fund dollars then, and be able to assist someone uh, meeting the income criteria to be able to make that improvement. Um, so I encourage you to reach out and, and talk to me if there are uh, ideas that you would have or that you would think that that would be a good way to be able to utilize your funds. Um, housing trust funds vary because I will say in Tama County, I don't know, you know, the housing trust fund, what, you know, what their priorities, different housing trust funds use them differently. But I know in our area, we try and respond to however, um, you know, the area would like to use the funds. So just, I would encourage you to reach out and talk to, and I'm happy to talk to you if you're in Tama County and you're thinking about something um, regarding housing, I'm just happy to talk to you about the housing project you might have in mind. All right. Uh... So just one last note, you can also use uh, some of your funds for administrative costs. Um, so, uh, if if the use of ARPA funds, I don't think this would happen for most of our entities, but if it gets you to the threshold where you then re are required to have a single audit, um, it could help pay for the additional cost of that single audit. Um, it also can help pay for consultants. So if you need attorney guidance on developing an application or uh, reviewing something you want to do, you can use your ARPA funds to pay for that, uh, that consultation. If you want to partner with your local COG to do some type of program and the COG needs to charge a fee, staff time, you know, you can use your funds for that as well. Um, 
it does also provide that you can use 10% at what they call a de minimis rate to cover ind your indirect costs or overhead costs in terms of administering the funds. And if I were sitting in a city's shoes, I'd probably want to take my 10% because again, I can, I can recapture those dollars and um, use that um, any way I so choose then. And I apologize. I've been saying that Tama County is in Region 12 and it's actually Region 6, so my, my apologies. Um, I knew it was Region something. <laughs> All right, um, so we'll move ahead now and chat. Uh, oh, then we just had one more example, um, which is, uh, this was something we were able to find online uh, from a, a smaller, not as small as some of the communities on our call, but a smallish community in Wisconsin. And I think they got their funds a little earlier than Iowa did. And this was a community that decided to go beyond the traditional water sewer project and they are using their ARPA funds in several different ways and they do have some applications developed for these programs. Um, so you can see just in this quick summary chart that they're doing utility bill assistance. Um, they have an e-commerce grant to help their businesses get started with e-commerce, a nonprofit grant, um, in addition to doing some uh, water sewer related reconstruction. So uh, if, if you want to take a look at that, we've provided the link here. Um, and so you can go out and, and just see what that could look like if it's something that you're considering. And so now just a few words on the management of ARPA funds. Um, so as Adam had mentioned, there is a covered period for these funds. It is longer than we had with the CARES Act, which is great. Um, so we're going March 3rd of 2021 through December 31st of 2024. Costs need to be incurred by December 31st of 2024. So incurred means that you've, you've, um, you've entered into the contract or um, basically to expend those dollars. You've either expended them or entered into a contract to expend them. You do, however, have until December 31st of 2026 to actually expend them. So you could enter into a contract for a water sewer improvement as late as December 1st of 2024 and still be able to expend those dollars out for um, another two years. So as I said, Tanya, you've got a little bit of time here, I think, to, to kind of sort out the direction your, you, uh, um, Swisher wants to go in terms of um, that, that water project. Um, so generally when we're thinking about government funds, there are some kind of specific little rules that go along with it. Um, I'm gonna say that they are pushing a lot of money out the door. And I don't think that the compliance of the size of communities that exist that you have, you know, I don't think people are going to be running around checking up to to see that you've dotted every I and crossing every crossed every T or that you're federal granting experts. I think people understand that you're not. What I think is important is that you're kind of meeting the underlying principles of the expenditure of public funds. And for most of you, you are already doing this in your day to day work. So you are making sure that you're meeting the requirements of the law or the budget or whatever document you have. In this case, it's the ARPA law and you're, make, you're gonna make sure that your funds are being spent on the intended uses. You wanna make sure that there's no conflicts of interest. You're not handing over ARPA money to your brother-in-law for you know, him to do the construction project. Uh, you want to make sure that you're fair and non-discriminatory in your application. So if you had a rental assistance program or utility bill program, you're not um, making it so that only a very narrow sliver of uh, a certain aspect of your population might qualify. Um, so you're trying to be as fair and non-discriminatory non -discriminatory as possible. And then lastly, competitive sourcing. So again, you're not just handing the contract to your, your brother-in-law, but you're going out and getting quotes for services and making sure that you're getting kind of the best value um, 
for your, your public dollar. So I think those are really the key underlying principles. And if you're, if you're good with those principles, I think you're generally going to be good in terms of your expenditure with these dollars. So when you're accounting for ARPA funds, I do think it's incredibly important not to just take these funds and just drop it into your your general revenue account, but instead to have a specific line budget accounting, a specific accounting line that is ARPA funds. It's going to show the receipt of those funds and it's going to show the exact expenditure of those funds. So that when you go, you can go back, you can see an accounting trail of, of how those, those funds have been used. And so Tanya is saying that she set up a capital improvement fund. And so I think that's great, again, but I'd want the ARPA funds to be separate from any other funds that might go into a capital improvement plan. All right, next slide. Um, so there were some other specific items that were mentioned um, in your award letter. Um, so just remembering you need to have a SAM.gov uh, registration. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and get that done. Uh, the record keeping on these is five years. So you're going to be keeping records related to your ARPA funds and the use of those ARPA funds for five years after they've been expended. Um, there is a single audit requirement. If you've expended more um, than 750000 in federal government funds. So I think for most of you, this isn't going to be an issue, but it could potentially be an issue if, again, you have a major water sewer project and you're getting a CDBG grant, perhaps, and you're combining ARPA funds to accomplish that, it's possible that you would hit that $750,000 threshold, depending on the amount of ARPA funds you have. And then lastly, Civil Rights Compliance Act. So everything we do, we want to do in a non-discriminatory way. And so you want to make sure that as you're writing contracts um, and other things that you're including clauses that um, remind people of uh, non-discrimination. Okay, can everyone, Tanya is saying no sound. Can everyone hear me all right? I can hear you. Okay, all right, good. Yes, okay. I can too, this is Cami. Terrific, thanks Cami. Um, so there's the, with procurement with federal funds, they have what's called the bear claw. Um, so I would generally for purchases of under $250,000, you've got a fair amount of latitude. You just need to be um, always documenting and always making sure that you're getting competitive quotes. Once you get over to that $250,000 threshold, then you need to do a more formal, um, either sealed bid process or, or competitive proposals for the service. Um, sole sourcing is allowed under federal contracts. I don't see any likely justification for doing a sole source, meaning you just looked at one contractor. Um, I think here it's, it's always in your best interest to seek uh, quotes from multiple potential contractors or vendors. It's hard to justify sole sourcing. So uh, as is the case with everything, documenting is very good. Um, so if I am looking at my ARPA expenses, if I were sitting in your shoes, um, and I used to be a city manager, so I, I was at one time sitting in your shoes, I would want to be documenting what I'm, what I'm spending these funds on, how these spends are responding to COVID and a COVID need, how the, the fund is author, how these, this use is authorized under ARPA. So is it responding to a public health emergency? Is it, is it um, the water sewer component of ARPA as an eligible use? Um, I'd wanna also document how the recipients of any aid or contractors or vendors were selected. So again, showing that competitive sourcing and or if, if we're giving out uh, grants to, to people or organizations that were impacted, how we selected those people or organizations, how we set that program up. And then lastly, uh, the record of payment. You will be doing some reporting with ARPA. 
Um, the reporting components are outlined here, basically your projects, your expenditures. There is some data they're going to ask about demographic distribution. Um, if you if you have questions about that, feel free to check in with our staff. I, I'm not exactly sure how they're going to what they're going to be looking for with respect to things like water and sewer projects. Um, Civil rights compliance, I think, is a yes no question, but um, they are also going to ask everything that you uh, sent to the state to get your initial award. They are also going to be asking for when you submit your first uh, report to Treasury. Um, so uh, I think that might be on the next slide here. Um, so if you remember, you had you'll have to have a copy of your signed award uh, terms and conditions agreement. So that was a document you signed and submitted back to the state before you got the funds. Um, and the copy of the Title VI uh, Civil Rights Assurance. And then a copy of the actual budget documents that validated that top line budget total that you provided to the state. So those three items are gonna have to be sent in again. And so then this is just an example of the types of things. We didn't, we're not gonna go into every aspect of this reporting. Um, but for example, for a small business assistance program, this is an example of the type of information that the report asks for, a brief description of the, the objectives of the program, the structure, the number of businesses served, um, and uh, your approach to ensuring that that aid actually is addressing the negative economic impact of COVID-19. Um, and this is a, is just a brief summary of the what they'll be asking for for water sewer reporting. So they're going to want to know the construction um, projected uh, start date, um, the date you actually uh, started initiation of operations, the actual location, and then if there are permit numbers, what those permit numbers are. I, I would note, and again, I don't think it's going to apply because we're talking to small communities here, but if your infrastructure project was over 10 million, these reporting requirements do change um, and they are looking for more what I would call Davis-Bacon type wage data. So, so do be aware of that if for some reason you had a very expensive project. And then lastly, um, just uh, wanted to, before we get into discussion, just to remind you that we are here to try and be of assistance in any way that we can. We're learning through this process as well. Um, so if you just want to bounce around ideas or, um, or if you like, hey, let's get together again and, and talk a little bit further in, in six months, we're happy to do that. We're also happy to help you um, if you want to facilitate brainstorming sessions with your consoles. We're a group of planners. We love to plan <laughs> so um, and facilitate. Um, we recently actually did a goal setting session and a capital improvement plan for the city of Alburnett. And it was really helpful because we were able to identify in that plan um, how they might uh, spend some of those ARPA dollars. <laughs> and then lastly, um, if you do want to do sort of a targeted program that's going to provide aid to a specific groups, but you don't want to be the people, you don't want to actually do that program administration, um, we could potentially be a resource for that as well. Earlier this year, we did a program actually for the city of Iowa City that I think was using CARES Act dollars, um, where they were trying to get business uh, support out to some of their very small businesses, and they had an application process. Um, and then our staff actually managed the application and, and the awards and the reimbursement of expenses to these businesses. And then lastly, the reporting. I think you guys are more than capable of doing it, but for whatever reason, if you don't want to do it, um, we can take that on as well. We would charge a, a, a slight fee for it, um, but you can use your ARPA dollars to pay for that. 